I would like to talk a little bit about this topic, uh, robust, precise, fast, choose two of these options for radiated EMC measurements. And to give some motivation, um, of course, we have this typical um, EMC coupling model. We have a source of disturbance somewhere, could be a Wi-Fi router, could be um, some other device that generates electromagnetic fields. And then we have um, a victim of this disturbance in the vicinity might be a screen, might be some other kind of equipment, some medical device, some uh, control unit in a car, what not. And now the question is, um, will there be some interference or not? Will there be a disturbance? And what we want to do is we want to ensure, of course, this electromagnetic compatibility. And today we will focus about the emission of these devices and we want to measure the emission of these devices. And the question is, how do we do this um, in the best and optimum way? And of course, as engineers or as an engineer, sometimes you say, okay, th there are standards for this. I would just apply this and that standard and measure the emission according to the standard. And, and, and this sounds a, a good and easy way on first glance, but um, from my point of view, as as a scientist, I would say it's 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 a good idea also to look um, into the underlying physics and also try to think about a little bit what happens really there and um, how we can apply the standard and uh, and still make it a useful measurement at the end. And and this is a little bit the idea and the background of my talk. So the fundamental question from my point of view is what is a good measurement to measure this emission? And what you typically measure is field strength in volts per meter in a certain distance. Um, you could also measure power flux density. This is what maybe people from um, telecommunications do. And also when they measure specific absorption rate, for example, um, something like in watts per square meter, also in a certain distance. Because of course, the more far you go away from the source, the smaller this field strength and the smaller this power flux density will be. Or what might be also a good option is to measure total radiated power of something. Um, and then this would be in the unit watt and it would be independent of distance. And the, the next question, the next fundamental question is which environment would be a good environment to do this measurement. Um, is it a totally reflection-free environment that we do not really have in practice? Or is it maybe an environment that has some reflections like most um, practical environments would have that emitted waves would bounce back and forth from, from some walls? Um, and that you have some kind of multi-path propagation? Or would it be more feasible to do the measurement really in some highly reflective environment um, with lots of reflections and maybe even resonances, standing waves and so on. Okay, and to, to more look into details uh, related to these questions. So I will talk a little bit about measurements in semi-anechoic chambers. Then we will look into reverb chambers. Then we will try to um, compare them and convert the results between these two environments. And uh, in this section, we will also briefly introduce what is the directivity of some equipment under test of some radiator. And then we have done some, so this will be, this will be the most theoretical part, let's say, then we, we, um, it gets a bit more practical once again. I will show some results that we had obtained in our laboratories in Magdeburg. A colleague of mine did some comparative measurements there. And of course, there will be some summary at the end. So let's start with semi-anechoic chambers. And the idea is we have some equipment under test, some, some radiator. And typically, this is some unintentional radiator. So it, it is not built to radiate, but it uh, creates parasitic emissions and we want to measure these emissions and we only want to measure the emissions of this equipment under test so what we need at first is we need to build a shield from the environment around we build some faraday cage we take metallic walls and uh, metallic floor and metallic ceiling and metallic doors and so this 
metal works like a mirror for the electromagnetic wave. So all the Wi-Fi and radio stations and everything that we have from the outside, of course, will be mirrored back, which is good. But all the emissions that would be created or that are created from our equipment under test that we want to measure, they would be also mirrored back by the walls. And we don't want to have these um, all these waves. We only want to measure more or less the direct path between the equipment under test and the antenna. So we put absorbing material on all the walls and on the ceiling. And you could also put it on the floor, but then it's not very easy to walk inside such chambers. So uh, the usual decision is to have not a fully anechoic chamber, but a semi anechoic chamber where the floor is made out of metal. So what you measure is not only the direct path between the equipment under test, but also one reflection uh, between the equipment under test and the floor and the antenna. And so there, there are two paths and there can be um, positive and negative interference between these two paths. So what you typically do is you do a height scan with this antenna and you measure these two polarizations, vertical and horizontal. And the equipment under test is placed on a turntable and can be rotated around so that um, with respect to these different directions, um, we can measure the emission. And we measure it in terms of field strength in a certain distance. And usually we want to make sure that we have far field conditions. So the antenna is placed um, in a certain distance so that we, we are more or less in the far field, far field of this um, emitter. And this is how it looks in practice. So um, we have one of these large semi chambers with 10 meter measurement distance in Magdeburg. Um, not in the building where I'm now because it would not fit in here. So well, we, we build it about 25 years ago. And uh, so there was a new building, let's say, built around this laboratory. And there are some other laboratories and offices there. But this is the, yeah, the, the one of the largest rooms, let's say, in this building. And you can see the absorbers on the on the wall and on the ceiling. And there's also, because this is here for some immunity tests, there are some absorbers on the floor and some antenna. And you can also see this turntable and you can see that the floor is made out of metal. So there are reflections um, on this floor. And this is basically um, the setup that you have in these semi anechoic chambers. So what we would like to measure there as set is the radiated field strength in the far field. And what we want to have, because this is the worst case from some EMC point of view, we want to have the maximum over all directions and this as a function of frequency for, for all frequencies, let's say, if we would be very strict. So what, what we actually measure, what we actually get is the radiated uh, field strength at a certain distance especially at low frequencies, if the wavelength is rather large, it must not necessarily be the far field of this radiator. And we cannot have this all directions. So um, we need to sample the directions. We need to sample or we need to rotate the turntable in discrete steps. And um, the standards are not very detailed on how much steps we need to choose. So it a little bit depends on the yeah, on the certain standard, on the experience of the test engineer settings in the program and so on, how many directions we need. But um, at least, let's say, um, 90, 90 degree steps, so four directions and this for um, um, a certain selection of frequencies. And if the device on a test radiates to the top or to the bottom, then we will not really measure it um, inside such a, a semi-echoic chamber. And then the rationale is, okay, typically in the past, maybe their um, devices were just located horizontally next to each other. Um, so if they radiate to the top, there is no other device there that might be disturbed. But... Um, yeah, in, in, in practice today in the real life world, of course, there might be devices stacked on top of each other. Um, so if they radiate to the top or to the bottom, they, they might 
create some interference disturbance there. So mm, this is definitely, let's say, some kind of blind eye of this measurement setup. Okay, so then let's look at the total opposite. Uh, let's look into reverberation chambers. And once again, um, the simple schematic or the simple idea is presented here. So once again, we have some um, equipment under test, some radiator. And once again, we have conducting walls or we do the experiment inside the shielded room because we want to shield ourselves from the environment and we only want to measure potentially the emissions of this equipment under test and not all uh, Wi-Fi and radio stations and transmitters from the surrounding. So um, now our device under test here creates waves. And now we don't have absorbers, so these waves will be reflected back and forth from the walls. And what we will get is standing waves. We will get the standing wave pattern um, inside this reverberation chamber. Yeah? So we get lots of, lots of echoes of the field inside this room. And... Um, To measure the field strength or no, to, to, to measure the emission, let's say, you need at least one antenna. Um, and now the result a little bit depends on where you place this antenna and where you place the equipment under test. Is, is the antenna placed in, in, in a maximum of the field, let's say in some anti-node of the standing wave pattern, Or is the antenna placed in a node, in a null, in, in some minimum of the standing wave pattern? And what you are interested in is like what's the average measurement at the antenna, or what is the maximum measurement at the antenna um, over the standing wave pattern? So you could move the antenna around in space, or you could move this equipment under test around. To, to change the standing wave pattern. But of course, you do not really want to move the antenna and you do not really want to move the equipment under test because there might be cables attached to it and it's not very practical to do so. So what, what we do is we take a large metallic object um, and move or rotate this large metallic object. And this metallic object will change the reflection of these waves. It will change the standing wave pattern and it will move the nodes and anti-nodes of the field through space. And these standing waves, they are called modes. And so with this device, we, we move the modes around, we steer the modes. So the whole thing is called a mode um, steered chamber or a reverberation chamber. And because um, the, the equipment under test um, might not only emit, but might al also absorb waves if it's larger and if it's made out of lossy material. Um, so then the, the equipment under test itself changes the properties of this chamber. It lowers the quality factor of this chamber. So typically you need a second antenna and you, you need to measure the coupling between the antennas to get some idea of what is the quality factor of this chamber, how good is the coupling between two antennas. And if you know this, um, yeah, so you, you, you um, radiate some known power here and measure this and then you can say, okay, now I, I stop uh, this antenna radiating, I let the device on a test radiate and um, then you, you, you measure what, um, what is received by your receiving antenna and then you can say something, what will be the power radiated, the total radiated power by this equipment on a test. And this is how it looks like in practice. So you can see one antenna over there. Uh, you can see some field probes to measure field strengths and you can see this large uh, mode stirrer with this metal plates to change the reflections of the waves inside this chamber. And mm, this, to be honest, this motorcycle here Uh, was a motorcycle of some former colleague. It was never actually tested. It was just placed into the photograph to make the photograph uh, look nice and fancy. But if you search the English Wikipedia for electromagnetic uh, reverberation chamber, you will also find this picture of our reverb chamber in Magdeburg with the motorcycle. And if you ever come to Magdeburg and visit the chamber, or if you look at more recent photographs, we three or four years ago we replaced the stirrer because the stirrer was not really effective and we replaced it by one of these classical um, z-fold zigzag stirrers let's say and so then people ask me hey if you if you have this kind of reverb chamber 
and um, if if you if you by accident hit the resonance of this chamber, do you not get an incredibly high field strength? And the answer is yes, we 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 get, but we are always in resonance, and we not only hit one resonance of the chamber, we always hit five or 10 or 15 or 20 um, resonances inside this chamber because we operate this chamber at a frequency that is so high that we always excite several modes at the very same time. And so then the question is, okay, how can we change these electromagnetic boundary conditions? As already said, we can have these mechanical steers. You could have uh, moving walls. You could relocate the antenna. It's not very practical. Or you could also switch between several antennas, um, which works nicely, but... Each antenna also introduces losses inside this chamber. And for immunity testing, you could have narrowband frequency changes, uh, but does not work for emission for sure. So um, these are some pictures and photographs from the Frank Levering group of the University of Twente uh, in the Netherlands and from Thales. And they, for example, built reverberation chambers with flexible textile, Uh, with uh, metallic walls that you could shake and that you could move around. And um, and so you just shake the walls and then change the field pattern inside there. And they developed it a little bit for uh, measuring uh, radiation of radar antennas on ships. And there you have the problem. You cannot bring the ship to an EMC laboratory. So you have to bring the EMC laboratory to the ship and do the measurement on site at C2. And there's a question in the chat. So um, the question relates to computer random access memory that has very low operating voltage um, of just 1.1 volts and less than one volt is on the horizon. Um, Oh, and, and now some very detailed questions about how how does this increase the computer circuit sensitivity to EMI? Very good question. I'm not an expert in, um, in let's say, immunity of computer chips to external fields. I, I would say um, for sure a little bit, but on the other hand, I would say it's not too difficult uh, to shield such ship from external fields and i think what is in in terms of emc a way 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 more uh, severe danger for such computer ships is uh, electrostatic discharge or um, stronger signals that are fed via cables via pins via um, uh, cables to such a computer ship And EMP, yeah, might be, but I, I would say, um, once again, if you have good ESD protection on your ship, it should uh, it should be also fairly fairly safe against um, EMP. EMP is much, or well, it's a little slower than ESD, um, but it's more related to immunity, let's say. Opportunities for MC engineers, for sure. I mean, every... Every new development uh, brings lots of chances for EMC <laughs> engineers to develop new solutions. And mini anechoic uh, chambers for in-house testing, for sure, there, there are some companies uh, that have this. But the problem is if you have this, if you build it smaller, um, like a tabletop device, we also have a tabletop reverb chamber. I don't have a picture in the slide set, but... Um, let's say this chamber here, um, our large reverb chamber is something like six by eight by four meters and operates starting at 120, 150 megahertz as a reverb chamber. The lowest cavity resonance in, inside this chamber is um, at around 30 megahertz. And so if you build a smaller one like this one, this is about um, one cubic meter of volume or let's say three feet, four feet by four feet by um, three and a half feet, something like this. So the lowest cavity resonance here will be in the range of um, 
150, 200 megahertz and this chamber will work as a reverberation chamber made maybe let's say starting from 800 megahertz, a gigahertz, something like this. So if you build small tabletop anechoic chambers or reverb chambers, mm, they, will, they will not work starting from the megahertz range. They will start working from the gigahertz range. But thanks for these excellent questions. Uh, maybe we can come to come back to this later. So this is um, a picture of such a chamber with a movable wall. So um, unfortunately, I have no video here, but it's a, it, it looks like a little bit as it is breathing in and out. Um, so we also yeah, change the boundary condition, conditions, change a little bit the volume of the chamber, change the reflections and get um, these field conditions that you want to have inside such a chamber. And these field conditions are homogeneity. So this field on a statistical basis should be um, independent of the position. So this allows you to have a free placement of the equipment under test inside um, such a reverb chamber, which is kind of nice. And the second important property of such a reverberation chamber is that the field is isotropic. And this means the field is in the, on a statistical basis. On average, the field is independent of the direction. So it does not matter how to orient your equipment under test. And especially, it does not matter how to orient cables. And I think this is also some, some kind of um, difficulty in these measurements in semi anechoic chambers. Um, if you have some equipment under test that radiates, then it's often the cables that radiate and work as parasitic antennas. And then you can get strongly different results if you arrange or place the cables in a different way. If you have them um, going horizontally from away from the equipment under test or if they go horizontal for some for some um, distance and then you feed them or you um, have them vertically going to the ground plane and so on and so on. And so here, orientation of the EOT, orientation of cables does not matter. But of course, these properties are only valid in the, in the so-called working volume if you are away a certain distance from the walls. And typically it's said that this distance is quarter of the wavelengths, maybe half of the wavelengths if you want to be more exact. And at the end, such a reverberation chamber is nothing more than a large, a larger microwave oven, uh, like the microwave oven that you have at home. This works at 2.4 gigahertz and um, cooks food. And our reverberation chambers are larger. And for immunity tests, at least for immunity tests, cook electronic chicken and do some immunity tests there. So. Going back to the theory, what we would like to measure there is the total radiated power for all frequencies. Um, and what we actually measure is the total radiated power for each measured frequency. So, of course, we need to sample the frequencies in a certain way. But this total radiated power is, um, is a little bit disturbed or is falsified by the statistical uncertainty of the measurement. And we, we still have or you still have some remaining field uh, inhomogeneity inside such a reverb chamber and you, um, you, you have a limited sample size in your statistics. Um, so you could somehow measure for a longer time and get more samples and decrease the statistical uncertainty. Um, but yeah, your rotating stirrer and even this shaking walls do not give you an infinite amount of uncorrelated samples. So your sample size is limited and that's why you have some remaining statistical uncertainty inside this measurement, unfortunately. Um, and the next problem is we, we measure this total rated power, but there is no limit for this. Uh, the limits are all given in electric field strengths at a certain distance. So um, you need to do some conversion between this. So let's have a look at this conversion. And for this conversion, what we definitely need 
is the electrical size of the equipment. And this electrical size is defined as K, the wave number, times A, and A should be the, yeah, the radius of the smallest sphere that is surrounding our equipment, our test, our radiator, our object. And then there are some remaining questions. Um, what belongs to the EUT if... Yeah, if you have just a small printed circuit board um, and a large plastic um, or maybe even yeah, metallic would definitely change. But let's say you have a small printed circuit board, but the large plastic case, will this plastic case also belong to the UET or not? Um, if you have an UT with cables attached, what cable lengths or which cable lengths needs to be considered to define this radius? Um, This is, let's say, under discussion. <laughs> yeah, but um, we need to have this wave number and we need to have this radius. And then we can look at electrically small EUTs where the product of wave number times this radius is smaller or much smaller than one. And the good thing is, no matter how complex these um, EUTs will be, If they are electrically small, if they are smaller in comparison with the wavelengths, they will always more or less radiate like a dipole. And um, this dipole radiation pattern looks like a donut. And if it's, if it's more complex, then the donut might be distorted a little bit. One side of the donut might, look, might be a little thicker than the other side, but still it's more or less like a donut. And for this donut, it's kind of easy to find the maximum um, emission because if you measure from this side or if you measure from this side, if you measure from the, the back side or from the front side that is cut here, you would get um, the very same result or almost the same result. And if you would do a spherical scan or some um, spherical cut in this, in this vertical direction, okay, then we would measure the maximum here. You would, we would measure nothing from the top, but we would once again measure uh, something very large from the other side. So for this simple dipole radiation pattern, it's kind of easy to get the maximum emission um, by sampling just a few directions around this. But, of course, we go higher in frequency and higher in frequency means our uh, wave number gets larger and then we get um, more difficult and more um, um, strange radiation patterns. And for this, I have a video and let me find the video. Here's the video. So these are measurements that uh, Magnus Hoyer of the Swedish Defense Research Agency, FOI, did a couple of years ago. And so here you can see the frequency and here you can see the, um, the maximum level. And this plot is normalized in a way that this maximum is um, always on the, let's say, outer radius of this. And you can see that if we go higher in frequency, that the, um, the lobes of this radiation that they get smaller and smaller and narrower and narrower and that this maximum that the direction of maximum emission that this also um, goes around so now it's measuring the maximum in this direction but now it's here to the uh, lower right and then maybe to the lower left and if I if I stop it somewhere here this is quite a nice picture um, so now you have the problem if you would just measure 90 degree directions measure in this direction measure in this direction measure in this and that direction you would not get the maximum and you would not be even close to the maximum because the maximum is in this direction and so you need to you need to do the measurement with finer finer steps maybe maybe go to 30 degree steps but even if you if you go to 30 degree steps you see okay the maximum will not always occur at at zero and 30 and 60, but it will be also somewhere in between. And the higher you go in frequency, um, the more, the, the narrower these lobes get and the more pencil-like um, these radiation lobes are. And if we, I will, I will skip to the, into the gigahertz range. And so then it really looks like, let's say like a hedgehog. Yeah? So there are many of these lobes 
And because it's some unintentional radiator, there is not one lobe that is super big, but they, they have, well, some of them have the same size, but as you can see now, it would be really, really challenging and really, really difficult to find um, the, the maximum emission um, of such a radiator in some anechoic or semi-anechoic environment. But I mean, this is what people try to do. And the higher the frequency, the larger the problem. So to be exact, you would need to measure all of these directions. You would need to rotate your turntable in, in very, very small steps, uh, going from 90 degree, maybe to 30 degree, to 10 degree, to two degree, to even one degree, something like this. And then it just takes ages um, to complete such a measurement. So maybe this reverb measurement at higher frequencies is a very good alternative um, but the question there is we measure total radiated power so how can we convert this total radiated power into a classical limit given in field strength in a certain distance and what we need for this is the directivity so the directivity of some device is power flux density in a certain direction um, given by these spherical angles theta and phi, um, azimuth and elevation um, in, oh, this is azimuth, this is elevation in spherical coordinates and then the average total radiated power in all the directions. And the maximum directivity will be the directivity of the main lobe. And for a short dipole, these, uh, the donut that you have seen, this is uh, 1.5 or something like one point. 76 dB over the isotropic radiator. The isotropic radiator does not exist. And for some electrically large EOT, it's something in the range of 5 to 10, could be 20, but le let's say something in this in this range of about um, 10 dB. And we all know this saying. Um, I don't know if it's popular in Germany, but at least it's popular. Uh, I don't know if it's popular in the United States, but at least it's popular in Germany. What are 3 dB between friends? Um, so it could be 7, could be 13. It's, it's something in this range. And so if we know this directivity, this maximum directivity, we can convert total radiated power into field strength in a certain distance. Uh, distance is here and in a fully anechoic environment, fully anechoic room. Formula is very simple. You need also free space wave impedance, a 377 ohm, and then... Um, this term here, which is more or less the surface area of some sphere. And for some semi-anechoic environment, um, formula is almost the same. What we have in addition is some geometry term. And this geometry term um, from the value range is between 0 and 2. And this takes into account the... Um, already mentioned reflection at the ground plane um, creating this interference between the direct and the reflected path so um, when doing a height scan with the receiving antenna you would typically make sure that this term gets two so that you have positive interference and so the remaining question is okay how large is this directivity because everything else we know and there's a quite good answer for this question um, published by also a German colleague, Ansgar Krauthäuser, uh, about a decade, a couple a little more ago, um, in the IEEE transactions, which is called Statistical Analysis of the Correlation of Emission Limits for Established. Um, so this means the semi-choic chamber and alternative test sites. An alternative test site is the, is the reverb chamber, let's say. And if we want to convert between um, semi-anechoic chamber and reverberation chamber, and so I've plotted some um, exemplary curves here, so you can see there's a con this, this is the conversion factor, and this is really how we can convert total radiated power into field strength or vice versa, taking into account the proper units. And this is with respect to frequency. This is for some larger EOT size and 10 meter measurement distance. Um, I will share a copy of the slides later. There is a link here. I will not click on this, but there's a, um, a MATLAB Octave script that 
does the calculation and that creates these curves. And um, the, the green curve is the average. This is the median or 50th percentile. And you can see the statistical uncertainty or the spread of these, of these curves. Um, and as far as I remember, I've created this with 10,000 um, simulation, 10,000 radiators, and the radiators are created by putting um, small point-like sources on a sphere, and the sphere has this radius here. So it's a it's a kind of theoretical generic model, but um, from my point of view, gives quite good results. And there's the same conversion for converting from fully anechoic uh, room measurements to reverberation chambers. Once again, for uh, the same UT size and three meter distance uh, with respect to frequency. Oops. And um, yeah, and okay. And there is um, another conversion between fully anechoic room and RC um, that depends on this. Ka this wave number, and I mean here you can see that for for um, small devices under test for electrically small ones, you end up with some constant value because you you end up with the directivity more or less the directivity of this um, dipole, and then for higher frequencies for smaller wavelengths and the same UT size. This is how the directivity on average increases. Um, and with this, it, it would be possible to convert total radiated power measurements from reverberation chambers into field strengths in a certain distance um, results and limit lines from fully anechoic rooms and semi-anechoic chambers. So the, 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 the question is now a little bit, what type of measurement would you like to have? Would you like to have this semi-anechoic thing where the environment um, is very deterministic. Yeah? You know exactly, okay, um, I, can, I can measure something in a certain direction and if I radiate onto something, I will have exactly this field and this field strength and so on and this polarization. But um, your EUT is random. You don't know the radiation pattern of your EUT. You don't know what will be the direction of maximum emission or what will be the direction of minimum susceptibility and the associated polarization and so on. And as we have seen, if we go for higher frequencies, it will be very, very difficult and very, very cumbersome to find this direction of maximum emission. So environment is nice, but there's a huge, huge uncertainty um, introduced by your unknown EUT radiation pattern. Or would you rather like to have this measurement here? where the environment is kind of random because you have the standing wave pattern and you have the stirrer and you don't really know what happens there. You just know, okay, on average, I have this and this and this um, field strength for a certain input power. I have a certain field homogeneity. I have a certain isotropy. And within um, some statistical uncertainty, I know my field very well, but just within the statistical uncertainty, Uh, but the good thing here, your EUT is deterministic. It does not matter how the EUT radiates, how strange its radiation pattern will be. Uh, it does not matter in which direction it will radiate. It, the, the, the result will be always reflected back from the walls and it will always end up um, at your receiving antenna. So these are, let's say, the, the two poles uh, that we have to um, decide in between. And I would say for... Small frequencies um, for electrically small radiators, this works quite well because then the randomness of the EUT is very small. I said everything at small frequencies radiates like a dipole. It's very, very easy to find the maximum emission of this dipole. But the higher we go in frequency, the the as mentioned, the stronger will be the problem here, the more random this will be. Um, and here the good thing is, The randomness of the environment here is independent of frequency. It's, um, it's, it's a matter of how you validate and um, how you calibrate, it, say, this environment and how many stirrer positions you measure. But the, um, the randomness here is, is fixed. And it's 
typically getting better for higher frequencies because then just very, very small movements of the stereo will create uh, the necessary field homogeneity and isotropy and so on that you would like to have in this reverb chamber. And here you more have problems at small frequencies at low wavelengths. Okay, so... Um, Going from the theory to some practical measurements, this is something that my colleague Matthias Hörte did a couple of years ago um, at Magdeburg. So he built kind of a generic EOT, a large metal box that is definitely electrically large, even at smaller frequencies with some um, radiating loops on the surface and measured this as a total radiated power measurement in our reverb chamber and also put this in our semi chamber measured Uh, the field strength in a certain distance. And then we took the, the reverb chamber measurement and converted this also into a field strength level, taking into account a directivity of one. So the difference between the two curves here, between the um, um, green curve for the reverb measurement and the um, blue curve for the seminicoid measurement, the, the difference between the curves is more or less the directivity of the EOT because as said for the conversion we just used one in this case um, and yeah so if you know the directivity or if you approximate it by some statistical model um, then you could get a better agreement but um, this the, 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 the not so good agreement here is um, is due to this let's say wrong kind of wrong directivity nothing has a directivity of one and there's a question i think from zurabi so um, go ahead and ask your question ah this is a good question so we used uh, a comp generator inside there there is no picture shown here but um, it's a small battery powered device and um, there is some something in there that switches on and off very rapidly um, with some kind of yeah with some kind of rectangular pulse strain function and so the um, the rise time and fall time of the signal is is very very short so you measure the harmonics of this rectangular pulse strain let's say and so you get um, I think the one that we had um, you can set the spacing to 10 megahertz and 1 megahertz. So in the spectrum, every 1 megahertz you get a peak or every 10 megahertz you get a peak. Um, and so it it nicely radiates over the whole spectrum. Um, and, and this is, yeah, this is definitely something that you would like to have for this type of comparative measurements. If you do this not with a generic EOT with some comp generator inside there, with a practical EOT, then a practical EOT will not will not radiate um, at all frequencies. So um, it's then it's difficult to do um, over the full frequency range comparison there. And so another thing that he did um, is he did, he repeated the measurement in the semi-nichoic chamber uh, with different steps of the turntable. So with 90 degree steps as it might be typically done and then with um, smaller 10 degree steps and then you can see that for the smaller steps there are at some frequencies like here and there and there and, and also here there's a huge difference um, between these two curves because for the um, as we've seen in the video before for the 90 degree steps you, you, you kind of under sample you do not really find the maximum emission so in summary um, What we all would like to have also in semi chambers is these robust EMC tests. Um, so we just put some device and a test in there. There are some cables attached. We do not really care um, where these cables are or which direction or in which orientation this equipment under test is placed. And, and still we would like to get a repeatable and reliable and so on um, emission measurement result but uh, this UT directivity this is kind of holding us back especially at at high frequencies um, and yeah we do not know the radiation pattern and that's why we do not know which 
turn table steps and how many we should sample and so on. So kind of difficult to do such measurements at higher frequencies. And there, there, there is a solution maybe. Yeah, we could do uh, emission measurements in reverb chambers and they perfectly work well at high frequencies and small wavelengths. And we get a very robust and reliable and repeatable result independent of the position where we place our EUT, where we, how we orient it, um, in which direction the cables go and so on, and what specific directivity and radiation pattern our equipment under test has. But unfortunately, there are no, no limits for this. Yeah? We don't have total radiated power limits. Uh, we have limits given in feed strings in a certain distance. And we would need to do this conversion. And for the for the conversion, we once again need to have this directivity and we don't know this. So all good things are never together. Um, we, we come back to the beginning and to the title of the talk. Uh, we want to have robust EMC measurements. Robust means, um, as said, we can place, we, we put our uh, device on a test inside the chamber. Uh, we do not really care about the exact position, the exact alignment, uh, the exact placement of cables. Um, still, we want to get um, a repeatable and reliable test result. We want to be fast. Um, we, we have economic reasons to do the measurement um, in, in a limited amount of time. And we, we, we also want to be precise. We want to... Um, Especially if we are very close to some limit, we want to know, okay, are we exactly at the limit? Are we below the limit? Are we above the limit? What will happen if someone repeats this measurement in a, in a different but similar laboratory? And so the... Um, yeah, within this Venn diagram, yeah, so now we have these overlapping areas here. So the reverb chamber, this is robust and fast. Um, but it's not super precise because you always have this intrinsic field uncertainty, typically um, within this 3 dB range that you use for the um, homogeneity of the field. And you could lower the statistical uncertainty by measuring more samples, more stereo positions, but then it takes longer time. It will not be fast anymore. So then we have something that is robust and precise. This happens if we go into the seminechoic chamber, into the seminechoic environment, and if we do the full sampling there, if we measure uh, lots of steps of our turntable, then we get a very, uh, very repeatable and very precise result, but it will take a very, very long time. It will not be fast. And so then we could, what we could do is we can, so for, for known radiators, when we know the radiation pattern, uh, we can go into the seminechoic chamber do a fast and precise measurement, but then it will not be very robust because if we change the um, UT a little bit, if we ch change the arrangement of cables, then we will change the radiation pattern and um, we will get not the same result anymore. So this, this perfect test that combines all these um, three properties, I think does not exist and, and, and will probably never exist. Um, it's some kind of uncertainty um, relation that we we have um, intrinsically inherent in this in these EMC measurements. So this concludes my talk. Thank you very much for the attention. And uh, then I think we still have um, some time, couple of time for Q and A for some short discussion and uh, further comments and remarks. Thank you.